this idea of suffering and the idea of questioning God. I think what we see in the in the final chapters of Job is actually an answer, an answer to Job for all the trials and tribulations that he goes through. And of course, these answers, they're a little enigmatic, so we have to dig into them. But but basically, what we find is, is that God here is telling us that only he can help us overcome human pride. In fact, only he can overcome human pride. Such is the nature of pride. Now, we're going to see that as we go through. What are, what are we going to be looking at? Well, of course, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us. And, you know, that Job is without exception um, a, a piece of scripture, I think, which broadly speaking, we often overlook. And frankly, you know, I, I've struggled with Job over many years. And it was only a few years ago when I happened to be going through a bit of a, um, a, a choppy patch, shall we say, a difficult time, that um, I started to become more obsessed with Job, you know, because the questions in Job, the big question of Job around suffering and around trials is, is something we all will face in our lives as followers of God and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, we go to the scriptures, don't we, for answers when we come across problems. And by the way, I had nowhere near the trials that that Job had to go through. Uh, but I'm sure, and I don't know, obviously, what circumstances you find yourself in right now. But I think we get great comfort from Job. And we get great comfort from the answers of Job. And it's here, isn't it? Job is here to, as, as, as all scripture is, to instruct us, to reprove us, to correct us, you know, it, that we might be complete, that we might grow and be perfect, truly furnish unto all good works. So we see great value, don't we, in, in all scripture, but particularly scripture that's relevant to us. And we're all sat here in lockdown. We're all facing trials of, 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 of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and some of us have been ill. Some of us know people that have been ill. Some of us have have fallen asleep. Some of us have known people that have fallen asleep. Some of us are suffering um, from other ailments and problems. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, um, that we also, like Job, could begin to start questioning and asking and pondering this issue of suffering. Now, just quick overviews. Now, I've uh, these slides are from another study, so forgive me. We're not going to go through all the detail on all the slides, but um, I've put them in just to kind of help us just kind of get a snapshot just so that if, if we're not that familiar with Job, we can kind of get up to speed relatively swiftly because we're going to focus on obviously on the last two chapters or the, yeah, the last, um, the, last, the, the last three chapters really of the book. So who was Job? Well, he's a faithful and wealthy man. We're told that. In fact, if we just flick over to Job chapter one and verse one, we will, uh, we will, we will find that we read there that um, there was a man in the land of us. Job chapter one, verse one. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And so we, we find that this faithful man, this upright man, as we go through the book, he undergoes a terrible trial and it, he ends up losing his family. They, they die and his wealth, all his possessions. He was quite wealthy and he begins to lose his health as well. He has physical and mental ailments. And we know that this fall of Job was instigated by an envious adversary or Satan empowered by God to test Job. And we know that God allows that Satan, as it were, to, to, to go through various trials. But, but actually, incidentally, um, particularly when we come to Job 42 verse 11, we find that actually God was the one who was instigating and in control of the trials that Job went through. We're not going to go through and, and do an exposition of the Satan at this time. So, um, so anyone who's on the edge of their seat, just, uh, just to sadly let you down on that one. We can do that another time, perhaps. Job has four friends that come and visit him. And together they discuss the sufferings. And really, they, they look into this, you know, kind of 
it, it, uh, why is why is Job suffering? And their their discussion is um, is is recorded through inspiration in this rather poetic language. So actually, Job is considered as a poetic book, and so the expression of what was said is is articulated by the Spirit in poetry, and it deals this book with the question, as we've mentioned, of whether God should should follow God for immediate reward, whether God, whether we should expect to be rewarded for following God in this life now, you know, and whether we should expect to never suffer and to have an armchair ride, if you like, into the kingdom. And of course, that's not the case. Um, so just a quick couple of other things. Some people, because of the the, the language in Job have considered Job and thought, well, maybe this is just like a symbolic book. Maybe Job wasn't real. And uh, I just wanted to point out that that cannot be the case. Job had to be a real character. He's mentioned in Ezekiel um, as a, a real person alongside Daniel and Noah. Um, and he's also mentioned in James in the New Testament and the patience that he had. So this isn't a symbolic um, representation. These these real events really happened. Job really lost his his um, his family and his wealth and his health. The friends really came, but the way it's expressed in the spirit word is through poetry. And I, I personally, I don't see any any problems with that. Setting and time. Well, it's interesting when you go through the book of Job because it would appear that that this book is very very early in. Um, his, history written, written very early. It's uh, probably, most likely, in my view anyway, when you go through the evidence, to be in the patriarchal period, before the law of Moses was given to the people of Israel, um, but after the flood. And of course, Job, as we've seen, he's in the land of Uz. So he isn't in, you know, he isn't, um, he's actually, uh, it would seem, you know, kind of connected to, to Abraham, we see some of his friends are, but a few generations off, it would seem. Um, and we can see that from various kind of details that we see in the book. So, for example, Job has a similar wealth as the patriarchs. Uh, you know, the same thing, sheep and various other things are, are mentioned. Again, as I say, I can't go through all this today, um, but the slides will be available, I'm sure, if anyone wants to, to go through it as a study. The, the same currency is used in Job as is, as is in Genesis and also in Joshua. This strange um, Hebrew, I can't pronounce it brilliantly, but kwasita, um, it's, it's translated money in the King James. And that kwasita, that currency of money, is, is also used in the, in the book of Genesis and Joshua. The friends' genealogies can be traced to, to a, within a few generations from Abraham. The instruments in Job are the same as mentioned in, in, in early parts of Genesis. There's no mention of the rituals of the law, but we do find Job gives offerings himself. And we know that before the Levites were selected, the firstborn of the family was the one who offered the, uh, the, the sacrifices. And before the firstborn of the family, the head of the house. So it would seem that, that this really fits into that pattern as well. We, we know that the flood is referred to. It would seem there's hints at the great ages of pre-flood men being, re being relatively recent. So in the memory of the people that were then within in existence. And of course, we have the land of us, which is in the east. And it would seem east of the holy land. So that's the setting and the time of the book. And, and so this man, Job, he, he's there. He's a believer in, in God. He's faithful. And he's true and he belongs, it seems, to a network of other believers who are spread out because when he goes through this trial, his friends come from a far, far, far away to, to be with him. And they sit with him in silence for a, a number of days, as we know. It's probably the best thing they did when you actually read what they then start saying to him. But they sit there and they, they, they then try and, and comfort him. And each of them advance in Various speeches. It's really interesting. I'll show you the pattern in a minute. But basically, each of the friends has three speeches in the book that Job responds to. And in each of their three speeches, they don't really change the, what their argument is. Even though Job tries to address it, they, they kind of they're quite rigid in their thinking. And they're all they're all motivated by righteous zeal. They are all believers. They all try to, um, you know, they, they're, they're trying to follow God, but they, they're missing something. And they, they, they really kind of have this idea, as I'll show you, of 
this, this kind of idea of direct retribution. In other words, Job, you must be wicked because you are, you are suffering these things. God must be punishing you because these things are happening to you. Um, and they, they basically, they, there's different characteristics. I'll show you that in a minute of these friends. It's quite interesting. But each speech lays more and more injustices at Job's door. Basically, each man thinks Job's wicked and wrong. And as Job tries to explain that he hasn't done some of the things that they're accusing him of, they kind of lay more and more lies at his door, if, if, if you like. And they accuse him of, of all sorts of things. And they were miserable comforters to Job, as we read in Job 16, verse 2. So I won't go into these details, but there's, there's these, different, um, these different friends have different characteristics. It's interesting, like Eliphaz seems to be the eldest. He's connected there, as we can see, with, with Esau. He's, um, he, he, and he has the thinking and the wisdom, if you like, of, of the Edomites, who were known for their worldly wisdom. Um, he he kind of is, he speaks with great authority and expects people to just accept what he says. He's very self-righteous. He's very confident. He's not flexible. He's not empathetic at all. And he insinuates Job is wicked and suffering, as I've mentioned, for this idea of direct retribution. And um, But he does realize God corrects through suffering, but he attributes the suffering to Job's wickedness, not to the wider principle of sin and, and the condemnation of our race. And so a key theme is his urge for Job to repent. Very unsympathetic, um, but he does look for God for mercy. So that's Eliphaz. And, and so these are some of the things that Eliphaz says to Job. Even as I have seen, they that plough iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of his years is hidden to the oppressor. If thou return to the Almighty... Thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. In other words, Job, you are wicked. You need to repent. You need to, to realize that you, you, you've got to admit your, your guilt in all of this um, because clearly you're suffering for, for some terrible sin that you've done. So that's Eliphaz. Then we have Bildad. Bildad is a Shuhite. Uh, Shua was a son of Abraham by Keturah. And um, so it's possible, um, you know, he, um, he, he comes from a place on the Euphrates. He believed in the revelation of dreams. He's, he's more rational. So he doesn't come at it with an air of, of authority like Eliphaz does. He, he's, he's like, he's quite cold and calculated. He's detached, un, uh, you know, unemotional. You'll find that as in his speeches, he's very sort of, uh, he dissects everything. He's unempathetic. He basically says Job is a problem to be thought through and solved, um, and uh, and he remains unruffled. He doesn't get annoyed by anything Job says or anything the other friend says. He's very calm. And so we get this idea of this kind of very calm, calculating person. And, and he likes to pose questions to Job and uh, imply um, answers. And basically, he, he rationally tries to show Job the same thing as life has, that Job is guilty. He says things like this, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would wake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out and the spark of, the, of his fire shall not shine. In other words, Job, you must be wicked because your light is dimming. And then we have Zophar. Zophar was a Naamathite, possibly grandson of Esau. Um, he's completely different to the other two. He's impulsive and blustering. He's got this abrupt manner. He jumps around from point to point. He's very impatient. He pointedly levels accusations at Job, like really bluntly. And he gets very emotional and very personal about everything. He feels things, it would seem. He counts things uh, very personally to himself, like his enemies and stuff. And so he seems to gain some satisfaction in the idea that the wicked suffer. It's a bit strange with him. He kind of has a, like a bit of a pompous attitude to that. And he argues that Job must be wicked because what has happened to him happens to the wicked. So it's the same thing again. And this is why we get, I think, confused as we go through Job, because we read chapter after chapter after chapter. And you think, what is being said here? And basically, it's the same thing again and again and again, just coming at Job from a different angle, dealing with this same accusation, this divine retribution idea. If thou prepare thine heart, he says, and stretch out thine hands towards him. In other words, your heart's not right, Job. 
For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul? Job, you're a hypocrite. You know, you really, you really need to accept that you are faulty and you've sinned, done something very specifically wrong. And of course, you know, God, at the end, you know, God says to the friends, you have not spoken, or Job says, sorry, of the friends, you have not spoken of me the thing that is right. These accusations against Job were not true. He, he hadn't done anything specifically wrong, as we will see. Now, if we, um, if we can, let's just flick over to Job 31, because we see in the process of the book that what actually happens, unfortunately, is that Job begins to start to justify himself. And we actually find in the responses of Job to the friends that he also has a problem. And he also has this idea that the righteous or the one, the believer, the follower of God should be rewarded for the great, you know, the following that 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 um, that, that believer has shown. And he, he puts himself in this camp. He says that, you know, he's, he gets to the point where he starts to justify himself. He says he, he explains some of the things that he'd been doing, like in Job 31 verses 1 to 12. He, he explains he's never committed the sin of adultery. He says he's made a covenant with his eyes that he should not look on a maid. And then in verses 13, um, to uh, to 23, he explains that he never oppressed the weak or, the uh, you know, he wasn't wicked like that. And in verse 24 to 28, he explains he never really had covetous thoughts towards other people. 29 to 30, he never rejoiced at other people's downfall. 31 to 32, he, he, he was always hospitable, he says. And in verse 33 to 34, he has this, this idea of the concealment of fear. He never sort of concealed his fear for doing, um, for doing things right. Now, in verse 35 onwards, we read this. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps as a prince would I go near unto him. If my land cried against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistles grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley, the words of Job are ended. And so we have Job proclaiming his innocence. But can you see there was an element of pride in what Job was saying there? He, he demands that God really should answer him. He, he, he says, you know, if, if God could, if some, someone could kind of put a hand on my shoulder, like, and, and it would be like a crown, he would value it loads. And in verse 37, he would declare unto him the number of his steps. As a prince, I would go near him. In other words, he would boldly go like a prince to God to justify himself. That's basically the essence of what he's saying there, because he he hasn't done anything wrong. That's his that's his ideas. And, and he's done all these things. He's never done any of these these sins. And so we find Job is really in this situation where he has um, he's basically justified himself and he thinks that he's righteous. Um, in verse uh, it's interesting because he basically shows his motivation as well in, in doing the right thing um, and following God. So like, if you look at verse eight, for example, it explains that this idea of, you know, this idea of the, the sin of adultery says, then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let me off my offspring be rooted out. In other words, he expects to eat because he hasn't done that sin. He expects a good harvest. In verse 10, he says, um, you know, if basically because he hasn't done these sins, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her. If, if, if he hasn't oppressed others, then he expects his family not to be oppressed. He, you know, in verse 14, we, we read that he expects not to be punished by God. What then shall I do when God riseth up and when he visiteth? What then, what shall I answer him? He talks about he shouldn't expect to have poor health in verse 22. 
Then let mine arm fall from my shoulder blade and mine arm be broken from the bone. So if you see verse 21, I've lifted up my hand against the fathers, then let these problems come upon me. Then let my health fail. So he's basically saying to God, your my health is failing. My family have died. I don't deserve this, God. Why is this happening to me? If you look at this in verse 28, it talks about like a court, um, you know, judging him. Poor crops in verse 40 that we just read. Basically, Job is saying, I shouldn't have any problems because I have done all the right things. Why is this happening to me? And brothers and sisters, I think we need to stop here and think about this for a second. No matter whether we're facing trials right now or we're not. Do we expect that God should make our lives easy for us if we follow him? Do we ever say, why is this happening to us? Why has God forced us all into lockdown? You know, we, 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 why and moan and complain and we groan. Why is this problem happening with my health? Why is that? Why is that person had to be fall asleep? Why, why have I got this illness? Why have I got this problem? Why am I, why have I lost my job? Why am I family, you know, being taken from me? What is, you know, we can also fall into this mindset, can't we, brothers and sisters? We might start to expect that because we try hard and follow God, that we should have some special treatment as if God is some benevolent father-like, uh, you know, Santa Claus-like figure who should just dish out sweeties to us because um, we follow him. And brothers and sisters, we know that that is not the case. Life is not like that. And this is the lesson that Job had to learn. But why does God then allow us and sometimes even cause us suffering in our lives? That's the big question of the of the book of Job. Now, I won't go into Elihu loads, but I, I know there's different views on Elihu. My personal view is that he he is a friend of Job. He was the youngest of the four. You know, we've got his genealogy. Um, he listens to all the arguments. He becomes frustrated and angry with Job. Um, and he becomes annoyed with the friends. Now, it's very interesting when we go through the speech of Elihu, because he, in my view, claims inspiration and he claims to speak for God. And what's interesting um, he is that he kind of gives four speeches and um, uh, towards the end, after the other three friends have spoken, and he accuses Job of replying without knowledge. And he deals specifically, and it's interesting when you go through, he deals very specifically what, with what Job has said. Not by, not, he doesn't infer anything. He just deals with what Job is saying. And it's interesting because he's not answered by Job and he's not condemned by God, which implies, to me anyway, that he, he is actually a prophet and he is actually speaking truth to Job. Now, we, we can debate that and we can talk about that. That's not the subject that we're going to deal with today but I just thought I'd mention it there. He, he kind of appears, does Elihu, as that mediator um, that, that uh, Job actually calls on. Now, I don't know if this chart is helpful. Um, I can see a couple of my boxes have shifted around a bit, forgive me. But what's interesting, here's the structure, right? So we have the introduction, then we have Job speaking, then we have Eliphaz speaking, Job speaking, Bildad speaking, Job speaking, Zophar speaking. So we get the first speech of all the three friends here, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And then it repeats, Job, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar. And it repeats again, Job, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar. Then Job gives two talks. Then Elihu, who we just mentioned, gives his speeches. Then God speaks. Then Job speaks. Then, Job spe then, then God speaks. Then Job speaks. And then there's an outro. And we can see in this a pattern, a designed pattern. You know, it's one of the hallmarks of inspiration when you come across structure. And, um, and I just think it's wonderful. We're going to be focusing in, on, in the remainder of our talks, on the second speech of God. I'll touch on the first one. There's, there's also other structures. This is from um, the Companion Bible. It, it, it suggests that, uh, that Elihu's talk is the is a centerpiece of a of a textual structure a chiastic structure which i think is quite interesting but let's go to let's go to job 38 so we read in 
Job 38 verse 1, Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. So there was this whirlwind, this storm around, and God is manifest in the storm, and God speaks. And he says, who is that this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Job had been brought in the discussion with his friends to a point where he had been challenging God. Answer me, God. Why is this happening to me? And God, out of the whirlwind, reverses that, doesn't he? Because God says, I'm going to ask you some stuff, Job. I'm going to demand that you answer me. So it's it's swapped round. There's Job asking God, and now God is, is saying, no, 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 let's get this right. You're going to answer me some things. And he says, dress like a man, gird up now thy loins like a man. It's kind of the idea of like a, a wrestler. And it, it's like an ideological wrestle that's going to take place, a battle of ideas, if you like. Let's Come on then, Job, you want to wrestle? Let's wrestle. And God asks over 60 questions to Job. And it's fascinating because Job cannot answer one of the questions that God asks him. Now, just for one second, put yourself in the drama of this situation. There's Job. He's lost everything. He's lost his wife, his children, his house, his health. He's on his last knees. He actually is wishing that he was dead. And he says to God, tell me what's going on. Explain what's happening to me. This shouldn't be happening. I don't deserve this. And by implication, he's saying, God, you must be unjust. And God turns around and he says, you answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Verse four. I mean, just think about how conceptually that drama unfolds and how that would have smacked Job in the face like a sledgehammer. Who was he to challenge God like this? How had he been brought to this point, this righteous man of challenging and challenging God? And God's first question, you know, just totally humbles us, doesn't it, when you think about it? God can do anything he wants. Where were we when he created everything? And what we find in, in the answer is that really we have to trust in God, brothers and sisters, because we are nothing really in the grand scheme of things. Absolutely nothing. It's only through his, his love that we have any opportunity of salvation and even life comes from his mercy. So it's interesting when you, when you actually look at Job 38, we're not going to go through it massively, but it, but it seems to follow the pattern of creation. Um, we have the, first of all, it's just a, a general opening speech around the, the supremacy of God demonstrated in the creation of the earth and the sea in verses 4 to 18. And then from there on in, from 19 to the end of the chapter, um, including, um, you know, some parts of chapter 39, it would appear that the days of creation are being referenced um, because it follows um, light division of the waters, the dry ground, the stars in the sky are mentioned. And then strangely, um, the days of five and six of creation seem to be slightly mixed up because we have, um, you know, birds as well as as beasts interested in if anyone's got any thoughts as to why that that might be the case. And what we find in the, the passage really is God is, is teaching us various things. As I say, it's not really our subject to deal with um, all of the, the examples in this first speech. But it is interesting to just point out a couple of things. You know, the creation that God has made, which is clearly being emphasized there, is there to teach us things. We can see that, for example, if you look at verse 17, it, um, it's talking here about the, well, what, what's called the ostrich. Um, and uh, in verse 17, it says, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding, because she, she doesn't look after her young. So we find that there's things in, in creation which we should learn from. Should we be like the ostrich? Well, clearly not. We need to have understanding. We need to look after. Um, you, you find this these other attributes, human attributes, are, are, are illustrated in creation. And it comes out again in like verse 
verse 20, about, about the horse, you know, the bravery of the horse. You know, can, can thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? You can't change that. And so what we find, in my view, is, is what we're getting here with these examples is that God is supreme in his creation. And we got that principle that he's teaching us from the natural things that he's made about spiritual things. He's teaching us about ourselves. God teaches us about human nature through his creation. And we think about this, you know, we see it throughout scripture. You know, you've got the clean and unclean beasts in the law. We've got symbology all the way through scripture. We're going to touch on it in our second study that draws out from the natural world lessons. And so, and we know that Christ, of course, taught in parables. So we know that all of these things um, you know, are, uh, are, are clearly to, here to teach us something. But the emphasis in Job 39 is, uh, is that God has created these things. Where were we when he created these things? Nowhere. We weren't even a twinkle in our mother's eye. We're nothing in that sense. And so Job then, as we read with our brother earlier, he then... Um, well, we, we, we read basically the end of God's first speech in, in chapter 40, verse one. Moreover, Yahweh answered Job and said, shall he that contendeth with the almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So what's your answer then, Job? So this is Job's answer. Verse three, verse four. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to put my hand on my mouth. How can I answer that? How can I answer those questions? As I say, over 60 questions. And Job couldn't answer one about all these wonderful things that God had created, the power of God's supremacy, his majesty shown in those things. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about because God doesn't finish. It's almost as though Job may not actually have, uh, have got the, the real point of what, what God was going to say. And I actually think God shifts gear a little bit in terms of the, the concept that he's going to now speak to, to Job about. So we read this, verse 6. Then answered Yahweh unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. So we're going to have this intellectual wrestling match and it's going to continue. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me, wilt thou also dost know my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? That's what Job was doing. Hast thou an arm like God or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? God was there speaking out of the storm. Can you speak like this, Job? No, you can't. And he says, deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. That's what Job had said, right? I'm going to march up to God like, like a prince to justify myself. And God says, well, do it now. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold everyone that is proud and abase him. And now, brothers and sisters, young people, friends, we're getting to the crux of the issue. Because when we question God, when we say, why is this happening to me, God? You, you shouldn't be letting this happen to me. This, this is not right. In effect, what we are actually doing is, is we are condemning God that we might be righteous, as it says there in verse 8. We are, in fact, displaying beast-like pride against Almighty God. And it's in all of us. And I don't think I'm not standing in saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm innocent of this. We all do this. We all moan. We all question. We all grumble. We all can't understand what's happening all the time to us in our mortal lives, in the trials and tribulations that we face. But do we ever question God? And if we do, we need to come here to Job to understand that we should not be questioning God. We should be trusting in him because it is only through him that ultimately our human nature will be destroyed and our pride will be brought low. And it's only through, we'll find, the circumstances that God brings into our life, even the suffering that we have to suffer, that if we rely and trust in God in all of those horrible things that sometimes happen to us, 
even death itself, if we are trusting in the Father, it is only then that he can work with us and our pride can be obeyed. And so we see that verse 11, God's telling him to cast abroad the rage of thy wrath. Behold, everyone that is proud and abase him. In other words, Job, you in you can't humble proud people. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low, Job, and tread down the wicked in their place. Because that's what God does. And that's what God is doing with, with, with you, Job, in your pride. You're not wicked like you haven't done a specific sin, like a tr- terrible sin. But you are, you are part of, of the human race. You have a problem of sin. And we all suffer from that in our mortality. And it needs to be brought low. And so suffering helps us do that. I know one sister said to me once, God sometimes puts us on our back so that we look up. And I thought that was such a a wonderful saying. And that's what God does through our suffering. And so as we go through, it says, hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. If you can humble the proud and bring them, uh, those that don't want to, 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 to be bent into the grave, Job, then I will confess that you can save yourself from this pride. But you can't, Job. And so now we come to Behemoth, verse 15 to 24. And um, we're going to look at, obviously, Leviathan in our second study. And these, um, these beasts, or it's a suggestion that it actually might be one beast because the word Behemoth is simply the word beast in Hebrew, um, in the plural, interestingly. Um, so it, 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 Leviathan could be an extension of that. We've broken the study into two because it does seem that there are the, 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 there, there's a sense where there's a different emphasis. So Behemoth seems to be an earth beast, a land beast, and Leviathan is definitely a sea beast. And, um, and it's interesting when we go through these. I think what, what we see in these beasts is that God is bringing them out. I think they were literal beasts um, as an example to Job of this point about pride. If you can bring people, things that are proud down, Job, if you can control that, then I will accept that you can control your human pride. And so we have these beasts brought forward to teach us about beast-like pride that we all have. We have Behemoth here, various features. He's got a strength in his belly. He's got a cedar-like tail and his brass and iron-like bones. Um, interestingly, in verse 15, it says, Behold now, Behemoth, which I made with thee. And so we get that, that connection back to Genesis and day six when the beasts were made with man. One question we all kind of, I guess this is a good question to sometimes pose. Could this be an extinct beast that we do not have around now? Could it be, as some suggest, a dinosaur? I personally am open-minded to this. I don't think we should be so proud as to think that the creatures that we know from, um, you know, from from the study of nature today, you know, are always the ones that have always ever been there and there's been none else. You know, creatures are going extinct all the time, aren't they, brothers and sisters? And we've got ample records around the globe of very strange-looking creatures. Um, I'm calling in from Wales. And uh, the... uh, the emblem of Wales is the red dragon, supposedly from a myth of an actual dragon. So, you know, I, I personally am open minded. This was an early book, you know, very early in, 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 in human history. And so it's possible that these and I believe it was the case that these were real creatures. And also think about this. Yes, God is going to teach spiritual lessons. But why does God say, behold now, behemoth, in verse 15? Like, like, look at this beast, Job, if that beast didn't actually exist. Find the one in the bottom right most bizarre. This is a, 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 from, a, from a, a, an actual mosaic um, dating to 100 BC. It looks like these chaps in the corner. If you look it up on Wikipedia, it's quite interesting. A big mosaic, but you can see it. It looks like these chaps are fighting a little dinosaur. You know, hey. Who knows? So I'm open to it. And, and uh, I know some might find that strange, but I definitely think um, that's a possibility. Now, it's interesting because just to point out, obviously, why is God bringing this to Job's example? As we've said, it's because this beast represents um, human pride. And God's saying to Job, can you tame pride? No, you can't. 
Only God can do it. Just like only God can tame this mighty beast that nobody else can tame. We have to trust God. Be him off. This beast is top of the food chain. God created him. It says in verse 19, he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Now, some people have suggested that maybe this is a hippopotamus. I think that was a, a common thing, but it cannot be, brothers and sisters. It says, um, doesn't it? You know, some of the description just doesn't make sense. A hippopotamus, it says his tail is like a cedar tree. And the last time I saw this tail of a hippopotamus, it wasn't like a cedar tree. It was like a little bit of pathetic string just stuck on the back of the, the, the hippopotamus. This is a mighty beast. We read that his strength is in his, his navel and his belly. And actually, brothers and sisters, when we pick up on some of these phrases, we find them used in echoes in other parts of scripture, as we'd expect with inspiration, but in very interesting ways. So this idea of the loins and the power or the strength, those two words, the only other time they're used is in the shouts of the proud Ninevites um, when um, the Assyrians, um, well, when they, when they were being destroyed, I think by the, by the if I've got that right, by the Babylonians. We've got the, the, uh, the, the force of his belly and we read of the power of the womb or the belly, um, the strength and determination of Jacob being used there. So we get the ideas coming through in other parts of scripture of these phrases got the tail that we've mentioned. He's moving his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. So the sinews are like his strong tendons, which support the flesh. Like the flesh is really strong with this beast. It's stuck on. It's obstinate. And, um, you know, it's uh, interesting in Isaiah 48, it says, and thy neck is, an iron, is as an iron sinew and thy brow brass. He's speaking about the pride of Israel. And so we get the, the echoes coming through of the pride man and the, the nation at the time that was proud. We've got this idea of the, the brass and the iron. And of course, we immediately think, don't we, of Nebuchadnezzar's image and the pride of the kingdom of men. And this idea of being strong, unbending and obstinate is just is just oozing from the, the concepts in how the spirit is describing this beast. And we know that that is what man is like. You know, it's interesting in Leviticus 26, I will break the pride of your power, says God to Israel. And I will make your heaven, political heavens, as iron and the earth as brass, unbending. The wicked are brass and iron, it says in Jeremiah. Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and iron. And we get this, this idea of this beast, which is just unbending and its connections with these strong, obstinate metals. And we get the other section then in verse 20 to 24 of careless relaxation of this beast. It lies under the shady trees. The mountains give it food. It doesn't have a care in the world. And it, uh, it, it looks at the rivers uh, and, and it doesn't worry when they're sort of the impression we get is that the, the, the floods of the rivers, it doesn't doesn't get concerned about that. It thinks it can draw them up into its mouth. So what's that all about? You know, when we think about the concepts, that the spirits kind of hammering home to us in the words here. Well, we've got this interesting verse, you know, where we, we read of this idea of, well, what, what does it said about Behemoth? Basically, he's lying down, he's, he's proud, he's relaxing. He's got all the food he wants and he's idle under the shady trees. And, you know, we get hints at that in other parts of scripture of mankind. So this one in Ezekiel, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, beam off. Fullness of bread, the food being brought to him from the mountains. Abundance of idleness, he's lying under the shady trees. And so we get these connections, these echoes. And it seems to think it seems to be that Behemoth thinks he's hidden. He's sort of lying down under the shades of all the leaves and the willows uh, of the brook kind of cover him. But we read in Leviticus 23, those willows should be used to to celebrate the things of God, not to to hide our pride. And then we've got reference. It's interesting. In fact, a lot of these, they echo back to some of the, the speeches of the friends when God's answering. So God is answering Job, but he's also giving messages to the, uh, the other friends and the pride of Eliphaz is there. And so we end with this idea that he drinketh up a river 
and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. We think that's interesting, right? Why is it? Why is Jordan there? Like, why? Why is that there? And, and if this is a beast, does this beast really trust in things? And we get this idea that again, we're getting an anthropomorphosis of 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 this beast. It's giving. It's being given human characteristics. And so we've got this idea, don't we, when we when we look at the spirit word of of how the word talks about rivers symbolically, they're like the powers of men, aren't they? We've got that with Assyria and Egypt and even in Revelation with the Ottoman Empire bursting forth like a flood over the riverbanks of the river that runs through their territory. Why the Jordan? Well, it's interesting because the River Jordan, you know, as you'll no doubt know, it starts in Mount Hermon, doesn't it? And it descends through the land, lower and lower and lower to the to the lowest point on the earth in the Dead Sea. And so it's a parable is the Jordan from from life to death. And it's interesting because that's the place where Lot left Abraham and he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and it's like he chose death, if you like. And we've got the place where Israel were baptized into Joshua. And do you remember when they go through, the waters reverse. And so we get this beautiful parabolic picture of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and that, that death is to be reversed and we're going to go from, from death to life in Christ. And the place, of course, where Jesus was baptized. And we've got this idea of the eyes where he looks, you know, he, he taketh all with his eyes. He can see all these things and Eliphaz references his eyes um, uh, in 34, uh, in other parts of, of Job. Now, I know we've whizzed through that, but what is the, what is the exhortation? Well, Behemoth, he trusts that he can just do anything. He trusts he can reverse life. He trusts he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. And that word trust is, it's, it's loaded, brothers and sisters, because in other parts of scripture, we're clearly told what we are to be trusting in. We're to trust in God like Hezekiah. We're to trust, put all our trust in Yahweh. And we're to trust in him. For thou, Yahweh, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. And that's what Job had forgotten to do. He was challenging God. He wasn't accepting the, the, the power of the Almighty in his life. Now, I just want to spend the last few moments... And I know I'm slightly over, but brothers and sisters, this is really exciting. And I really hope that it will be worth doing this. Can we keep a hand here in, well, keep a hand in Job. And let's just go over to Daniel chapter four. I apologize to my president for, for going over slightly, but, but this will be, this hopefully will be um, of interest to everybody because we see the wonder of inspiration. Go to Daniel chapter four. Now, what's Daniel chapter four all about? Well, of course, it's about King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it's interesting because in verse one, it says that this chapter was actually written by King Nebuchadnezzar. He was inspired to write this chapter, I would suggest. And it's actually a letter to all the people that live in his dominion. And it seems to be written toward the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that this account is the account of the conversion, the final conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, we read in, in chapter two, of course, of the dream of empires um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the metallic image, the, that dream. And at the end of that, kind of Nebuchadnezzar kind of recognizes God. But then in chapter three, we read that he kind of rebels. And instead of accepting the different, that, that there was going to be another kingdom after him in silver, another one in bronze, another one in iron, and the stone that comes in the kingdom of God. Instead of that, we find that Nebuchadnezzar's made a whole image of gold, resisting the, the 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 prophecy and again he's brought low isn't he after the um the incidents of um of the, the the four friends who he throws into the furnace three friends sorry and then we get chapter four so interesting look at this um i think it records his last chance and this is why it's such a dramatic thing now we've got verses 10 to 12 he sees this vision it's like chapter two he sees a vision he sees this tree in verse 10 in the midst of the earth. Height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof and all flesh was fed of it. 
And so we see this great tree. Wouldn't it be interesting if it was a cedar tree? I don't think we're told that, but it's interesting because we have this great tree. And under this tree, there are all these beasts. There's behemoth under the tree, and they're all eating from this tree. And in verse 13 to 18, we read that as he's watching the tree, it gets cut down. And the stump of the tree is iron and brass are, are used to contain the stump of it. And we get all these connections back to Job. And Daniel then gives the interpretation in verses 19 to 27. He says in verse 20, the tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven and all the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowl of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king that art grown and become strong for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. So Nebuchadnezzar, you're this great tree, but because of your pride, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be cut down. And so we read of the fate of Nebuchadnezzar in, in verse 24. He says, you know, that, that these, um, the, these things are going to happen to him. He's going to eat grass like an ox in verse 25. That's what was going to happen to him. He's going to be brought low. Isn't that interesting? Because what does it say of Behemoth? He eateth grass like an ox. And in verse 27, Daniel advises the king. He says, Whereof, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, or the margin has a healing of thine error. So Daniel, what we find is Daniel is counseling the king. Daniel's saying to him, maybe if you if you repent of your pride, if you look after the poor, if you if you take God seriously, this fate will not befall you. But what happens? Verse 29, at the end of 12 months. So it's almost as if Nebuchadnezzar took on board Daniel's suggestion, tried hard for 12 months. But after that, he just couldn't contain himself. His pride bubbles up. He walks in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my, the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was in his, the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And that was the burden and the trial of Nebuchadnezzar. He was to know and learn that God is in control. And it says in verse 33 that that, that happens, that everything that, in, that, that was said happened. And we know the story. He did eat grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hair were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. And what are we being told here? What is Nebuchadnezzar learning? That human pride, brothers and sisters, it's like a, a form of insanity. You're a beast. And that's what you are. And if you're proud, you start to think like a beast and you're going to be shown that. And that's what the example was given to him. Now, it's interesting because in verse 34, and we're getting to the point here, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes into heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. So after this period of time, the beast-like Nebuchadnezzar, who's been brought to his knees in humility for his pride, his understanding returns to him and something remarkable happens. As soon as that understanding returns to him, he says a prayer. It says, and I bless the most high and I praise and honored him that liveth forever. And as we go through the prayer, what we realize, brothers and sisters, with careful Bible reading is that actually King Nebuchadnezzar was very well acquainted with scripture, at least concepts of scripture and some, some parts Actual parts of scripture are quoted by Nebuchadnezzar in the field as he obtains his understanding back again. So we have the most high. Of course, we think of Genesis, the most high God, Melchizedek, him that liveth forever. Concepts of that appear in the Psalms. Who's, look at this. In, in, in Whose dominion, says Nebuchadnezzar in his praise, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. It says in Psalm 145, thy kingdom, God's. Is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. 
Nebuchadnezzar, brothers and sisters, knew his scripture. He'd, be, he'd been counseled by Daniel, one of the greatest prophets. And he had been taught these things, but he'd been resisting with his human pride to trust in God. And he'd now been brought down like an ox to the ground. And, and as soon as his understanding comes back, he, uh, he quotes from God's word. God's word is the antidote to human pride. And it goes on, you know, every section you can find. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing seems to be a hint at Isaiah 40, 15. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? No one can challenge God. No one can say to God, what, what are you doing? What doest thou? And there's a hint there at Psalm 100. 15 but brothers and sisters oh and finally in verse 35 there's another kind of end part now i nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he god is able to abase and so we have other hints there in the psalms all the way through but do you know what brothers and sisters is absolutely remarkable about the worship of King Nebuchadnezzar as he reflects back with understanding scripture to the God of heaven, the, the King of Kings, how, how he, he quotes scripture in, in honor to God in his praise. Guess also where he quotes from, my beloved brothers and sisters, none other than Job. And so it's interesting if uh, if you actually have a quick second, if you just go back to Job 9 and keep and just have a quick look at Job 9, you'll find that that here we have the first speech of Job. Um, basically, before Job starts to justify himself, when Job is really, you know, really in his humility and in Job 9 and verse 12, um, you know, Job is answering um, uh, one of the first uh, Bildad, I think it is. And he says um, he talks about truth in verse two he talks about the wise of heart and one of the things interesting that was happened to nebuchadnezzar was his wisdom was taken away wasn't it um he was given a beast's heart a beast's understanding um when you go through job nine we read of the praise of god and and in the creation and clearly job believed the wonder of god at this point and and was in humility and 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 um uh, obeisance to god and in verse 12, we read, behold, well, verse uh, 10 for connection, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, and I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, what doest thou? Who can challenge God? Who can say to God, what are you doing? And later in Job, that's exactly what Job does. It's a tragedy, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that that's what happens to Job um, when he's pushed by his friends. But all of this was part of God's will to bring him low. And the other thing, uh, the other part that I think uh, is being quoted in, in the back end of Daniel 37, it's more of a hint at Job 40, where God says, those that walk in pride, well, that Nebuchadnezzar says, those that walk in pride, God is able to abase. And in Job 40 and verse 12, we read um, of the challenge of God. Remember how God says, look, look on everyone that is proud, Job. Bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. And Nebuchadnezzar had been brought low and Job had been brought low by the majesty and the wisdom of God. And I just think that that's absolutely wonderful, brothers and sisters. And we just we'll leave it there for a few minutes. I think there's a break now, but we just kind of staggered, aren't we, by the by the wisdom of God and the mighty majesty of God compared to our beast like pride. The antidote is God's word and a mindset of humility. It's folly for us, brothers and sisters, isn't it, to question almighty God, to resist him. It is for us to accept that he is all supreme and we can only but trust in his ways.